most of us identify as a person in the sense that we live for a certain time span. Uh, we have certain organismic needs. Uh, we have a physiology. Uh, we have social relationships to our environment. Uh, we have relationships that we serve. We have a greater whole that we serve um, that gives rise to our spirituality and so on. And all these things define what we try to keep stable, what we perpetuate, the thing that we try to control, the control system that we are for. This is where we are the thermostat for, right? All these dimensions of needs. A few hundred physiological needs, a dozen social needs, a handful of cognitive needs. And uh, keeping all these in balance uh, gives rise to our identification. The identification is the result of us making models of how these needs relate. And so we create a hierarchy of purposes. The needs themselves are not sufficient. We need to have a model of what is going to give us pleasure and pain. And uh, this is what we would call a purpose. And the purposes need to be compatible with each other. And this hierarchy of purposes that we end up with is in some sense our soul. It's who we are or what, what we think we are, what we think of as ourselves. And can and, we change uh, this hierarchy of purpose? Yes. Of course we can, we do. Our, in our the course of our life, it changes. So for instance, um, for most people, it changes radically when they have children. Right. Um, what I mean is, can we consciously direct it? Can uh, yes, we direct but, it? It sounds yes. like it's the mind. There's something behind us that's producing us, and we're just players in this game. Yes. We have the feeling that we're controlling it, but we're actually just being told what to do. So we can control it in such a way that we uh, identify pathways in which the models that are being created in the self or as contents of the self inform future behavior. And uh, of course, there is uh, the self itself is not an agent. It's a model of that. But uh, you can experience that uh, from the level at which yourself is constituted, you can change the identification of the self. This is basically Keegan level five, where, where uh, uh, an agent gets agency not just over the way it constructs its beliefs, but also agency over the way an agent constructs its identification. And uh, colloquially, uh, we talk about these states as ones uh, of enlightenment, because we realize that the way things appear to us, that these appearances are representations, that things are not objectively good or bad, that, but that there is a choice that happens at some level in the mind whether these things are being experienced as good or bad, and that we are responsible for our reactions to things. And the way that we react to things is instrumental to higher level goals that we might have. And once this happens, we can learn a number of techniques in which we change uh, how things appear to us. So uh, for instance, uh, when you do the dishes, this might, uh, so, so you, you might f find it horrible to do the dishes because it takes time away from you. It's, uh, uh, it makes your fingers wet and sticky and um, it's annoying and so on. Uh, you, you could also realize it's time out for you where you just do a very simple uh, physical task that itself is pleasant because it's nice and warm on your hands. Uh, your body doesn't hurt while you do it and you get some time to contemplate and you need to do it anyway and you can turn this into a time that you enjoy, right? And you can get agency over the simple thing. So this sounds like in self-development where they would say, just reframe your problems into something positive. So let's say you have to run. You're, you hate running. You just say, well, I'm doing something that's good for my body. I like it. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, are you just uh, telling yourself a, a different story consciously or do you experience the story as being different? And so, so uh, the intended result is, that something happens upstream of your experience, which means you now suddenly experience doing the dishes as pleasant, intrinsically pleasant. It's not just you're talking yourself into uh, some kind of uh, delusion that mm -hmm. uh, makes you pretend that you like right. it. So how do you cross that barrier? Because if you just tell yourself, well, I like this task, I like this task, even though you hate it, you feel like you're being self-deceptive and it doesn't work. So how do you actually get it so that you experience positive emotion from it? In that case, it's super simple. You just focus on those aspects of the task that are, uh, that for instance, contain sensory pleasure. And uh, there is, uh, on, and the aesthetic pleasure of being able to follow your own thoughts where you do something that does not bind your attention very much and is not directed on say uh, work goals or family goals or something else, right? So you can uh, enjoy the mental freedom that you get and you can enjoy the uh, pleasant aspects of the sensation of the warm water and the soap and the movement of the hands and the uh, 
uh, softness of the cloths that you use for uh, cleaning and the hardness and uh, of, of the things that you are cleaning and so on and the sense of cleanliness that you are uh, creating in the world and the aesthetics that are involved in that process. In the same way, if you uh, don't want to do the dishes because it, thinks it takes attention from you, you can focus on the negative aspects. And uh, by emphasizing this in your attention, you basically uh, put a spotlight on this part or that part of reality and you make it, uh, you emphasize the parts that you experience in there. Right. So you can get pleasure, aesthetic and sensory pleasure from a task uh, and you can get uh, sensory horrors from it and aesthetic displeasure from the same task if you focus on different aspects of it. If it's a matter of changing one's focus from the negative to the positive, how could we seldom do that? If it's so positive, I mean, if it's so net positive to look at a task and just focus on what's bringing you sensory pleasure, why don't we do that? I suspect that we don't have intrinsic attention on this for the most part because it would not be useful if we would hack ourselves in this way. Maybe there is a reason why we don't like doing the dishes or we like doing the dishes that uh, we are not wise enough to discover. And if we could just reprogram our uh, reaction to things before we understand that reason, uh, maybe that would be premature and we would end up in a local optimum in the way that we organize our life, where we end up uh, being a dishwasher when we should instead be a lover or uh, an, an artist or an explorer or uh, an intellectual worker, right? So uh, maybe it's too early to, uh, to reprogram your experience before you know what you're actually doing. I see. So you have to you have to understand yourself because there could be an yeah. evolutionary reason suspect, for why. Yeah. Okay. I suspect evolution would have given us the ability to reframe our experiences uh, fundamentally if that would have been useful. And the fact that it's not is uh, if you cheat yourselves into experiencing whatever you do as pleasant too early, uh, it might make you very happy, but also dysfunctional.